Oh my gosh. David Williams, welcome. Welcome to Operation Phoenix. Well, I'm absolutely honored to be a small part of it. Thank you for asking me, David. I, I couldn't be happier to have you, and, and for a very good reason. So you come at a good time during this virtual convention because we're talking about the fact that being a Bond fan transcends gender, age, socioeconomical status, and fame. And you are arguably one of the best known Bond fans, but let's start with the basics. Where does this passion for Bond come from? Well, I like that you think it transcends age and gender in that we are both men called David uh, <laughs> who are middle-aged, I'd say. Um, my passion began when I was about six or seven years old and I was taken to a double bill. God, when you had double bills, this was bliss. A double bill of Spy Who Love Me and Live and Let Die. Now, can you think of a, of a better double bill than that? No. And so I spent four hours in the cinema in the company of James Bond. And I was absolutely, obviously, enchanted from, from the moment it started. And, uh, and then, of course, I started trying to piece together what James Bond was and how there was, a, there was already two other actors who played the role. And, uh, and then I think in the 80s, you started to see Bond movies on television a little bit more. And so I sort of started to understand there was this whole world of movies. And I fell in love with Barbara Back, age six. And, um, and I got to meet her and I said how much she meant to her. And then I got to meet her again with Ringo Starr. And I said, your wife was my first crush. And he went, she's my last. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Perfect so answer. But I do think Spo Love Me is the sort of perfect introduction to a child who is a Bond fan because it's very larger than life. Um, you've got Jaws, you've got the amazing sets. Um, it's the, the, the plot isn't very complicated and there's plenty of action. Was it a family event for you to watch Bond, whether it's in the movies or on TV? Um, yeah, it was certainly my dad was into James Bond and certainly we go as a family. I was very lucky because my mum and dad used to take me and my sister um, to London. I grew up a little outside of London and we got to London as a sort of treat a couple of times a year and we'd see a big movie on the big screen. So I was very lucky I got that big screen experience. But I can remember pretty much all the cinemas I was sat in when I was watching Bond movies from Live and Let Die onwards. If you ask me where I saw each film, I can actually remember. It's not interesting to people, but I can actually remember what cinemas they were because I remember the experience of being in the cinema and that being exciting. So besides being white and David and middle-aged, we have another thing in common. The Spy Who Loved Me was my first James uh, Bond film as well. So I'm 48 years old. How, how old are you? I'm 52. I have a few years on you. You've had a lot of work done though, haven't you? That's why you look so good. Just tons, tons, <laughs> tons of operations. You could see all the nips and tucks. Yeah, it's horrific. Uh, it's a great starting point, isn't it? Because it's a, a very, as I say, very child for any Bond. But, um, but as a double will with Live and Let Die, it was absolutely sensational. And of course, as a child, there's lots you don't understand. You know, partly the, the sort of eroticism of the films, um, the darkness of the film. Live and Let Die is really dark. It is. And it is. the ending is like really disturbing as a child because it's such a bizarre and unnerving ending on the train. Um, and so... And so, yeah, it's a whole world that was exciting. And of course, Spy Who Loved Me also uh, was famous for the, for the Lotus Esprit, which was a very popular toy at the time, which I obviously had. And I also had the Goldfinger car. And um, yeah, I mean, the, for, the, for the next 41 or two years of my life, um, I sort of wanted to be James Bond from that moment on. Did it, did it ever wane, you know, when you were in high school or college and you start to look elsewhere for it, it, interest? It, it did a little bit. Well, I was a student um, at Bristol University. It was quite a sort of radical course in drama. And at that point, there were no Bond films being made because it was like 1989 to 1992. And although I sort of sometimes watch one on television, it wouldn't have been very fashionable to say I liked James Bond because we were all into really pretentious things. And obviously James Bond was sort of sexist and... Um, you know, it just wasn't something that you would learn about on the drama course. Um, and so, yeah, it kind of had waned a bit, I guess, because it was a bit unloved at that period. 
It was a little bit sad, wasn't it? Because there was a point when we thought there may never be another James Bond movie because it was the That's longest true. gap, wasn't it? Six years. Yeah. yeah. So what is it about, I've got the movies, I've got your early passion, you know, it's almost like a psychiatrist dream, which that's similar to mine. What is it about James Bond as a character, you know, this capable individual, since, you know, there is sexist, misogynistic moments, what is it about him that you connect with? Well, not the sexist and misogynistic. <laughs> I didn't think so. I think it's to me, I mean, I know it's brewed lots of different things to different people. To me, it's about what it is to be a man because he's sort of ultimately sort of the most male man you can imagine. And two, and this may be just because I'm British, but I think it's sort of what it is to be British. There's something about the Britishness of the character that really sets him apart from so many other um, action heroes. And although he's a tough guy, he's not a superhero. And he's also not a kind of, you know, Sylvester Stallone, Rambo type sort of muscled up um, kind of superhero. So he has to use his wits. Um, one of my favorite moments is on a Majesty's where he rips out the insides of his pockets um, so that he can use them um, to go down the, the wire on the cable car. Those kind of moments are fantastic, aren't they? Because as a kid, you sort of think, oh, wow, yeah, um, maybe I could pluck a hair out of my head and stick it over the door like in it's Dr. No, isn't it? And, and work out if someone's been in the room or not. Um, and so, uh, so, yeah, I think it's about what it is to be a man and what it is to be British. And also I think the wonderful thing about the films and the producers always said this, they're just there to entertain you. I mean, most films, they, you know, I love Hitchcock films, for example, which often have quite complex themes. Well, you, the Bond movies are not troubled by those. Bond movies are there to entertain you. They do their job brilliantly and then they're over. And um, you can't wait to watch them again. But I, you, I, I don't often find myself sort of lying in bed at night wondering what the meaning of Octopussy is. <laughs> that was just a fun movie. That was a really fun movie. Can't wait to see it again. With, I, you know, it's funny you bring up Octopussy. I find that there are some films as an adult I'll go back to thinking that they were absolutely ridiculous and just, and I don't know if it's the nostalgia factor, which is a very important psychological tool, nostalgia, but there's something about them that I'm appreciating more. Do you find that as well? Yeah, you appreciate them in different ways and you understand, you start to maybe appreciate the performances of some of the actors in a different way and the mechanics of the plot, perhaps, in different ways. Um, it's interesting, you know, there's so many movies, so many to choose from, and it's all right having some ones you don't like that much. But even the ones I find that I don't like that much, there's still bits of them that I really want to watch again. So I can never totally like, write one off because I think, well, I'd just like to see that car chase. I'd just like to see that a pre-credit sequence or something. So I kind of, uh, I don't know, I've got time for all of them. And I was lucky enough um, to meet Roger Moore and get to know him quite well. And I was actually in a restaurant in London, the Ivy restaurant. So it's quite a famous restaurant for often having well-known people in there. And I just done this sketch show called Little Britain. So I was a little bit known in, in the UK. And um, he came up to my table and he went, I'm a lady, which was one of the catchphrases from, from Little Britain. And then I sat and, and talked to him. And... Um, and from that moment on, we were like, we were friends. I got to interview him at the British Film Institute. I got to have lots of dinners and lunches with him. And he even called me on my birthday, which was amazing. Um, I, I just got this call. So at eight o'clock in the morning, I was lying in bed. And I had this, well, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear David. Happy birthday to you. And I was like, who's this? And he went, it's Roger Moore. And I went, Oh, hi. Uh, thanks for calling. I'm actually lying in bed naked. He went, so am I. I went, it's such a shame we're not together. He went, I know. He was just the funniest, most charming man. And uh, uh, I know his kids well as well. And um, I just couldn't believe that I was meeting my childhood hero. And also, he did not disappoint in any way. He was very funny, very self-deprecating. He also, luckily didn't mind talking about James Bond. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes, I guess if you, you know, you get to meet Paul McCartney, you go, mm, tell us about the Beatles. He probably rolls his eyes because he's, he's got nothing more to say about it. But um, Roger carried on being an amazing ambassador 
um, not just for himself, but also for Bond and, of course, for UNICEF. So he was a real hero of mine. And I was thinking about him a lot because as we're speaking today, yesterday was the third anniversary of his death. And I got to go to his, his funeral in, in Monte Carlo. And I, I read the poem, If, his family asked me to. And then um, I also got to speak um, at his memorial service as well, which was very, uh, very emotional. And very, it was amazing sort of having to follow Sir Michael Caine. Mm. Um, uh, talking about him, but a uh, much loved figure. And I'm really pleased that at Pinewood Studios they have a the, the Roger Moore stage because I feel like he was such um, a special star and a special man that his legacy deserves to go on forever. The w the wonderful thing I think about him too is every fan that met him, he made them feel as special as yeah. David Williams. I mean, he made them feel like a star. He he lit up the room, yeah. but he he lit them up as well, which was amazing. Yeah, he was a very gracious, wonderful manners. I remember sitting with him in this restaurant in the south of France, and a lady just came and sat at our table, a total stranger who was just a fan of his. And he was really gracious about it because the waiters were coming over with, oh, uh, Mr. Moore, would you like this lady to go? And he was like, no, no, no. And then she just sat there and spoke to him. And I thought, well, he's very, well, he's very gracious because it's a little rude to sit at someone's table when you haven't been asked. I mean, it's not obviously a problem for someone to come over and talk to you, but actually to sit down next to you is a little Im imposing, but he was not the least bit ruffled by it. And he, 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 you know, he didn't want that lady to walk away, I guess, thinking she'd had a bad experience meeting him. So, so it was, it was wonderful to see his patience and his graciousness. And um, I think his self-deprecation was a very, it was a brilliant tool. I remember him saying in an interview once, I get bad reviews for films I'm not even in. <laughs> he said, there's a review that would say, well, at least it wasn't as bad as that awful Roger Moore. So it's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Because, because I think he actually is a really good actor and at moments in the series, he really gets to show that. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but you know, it's a wonderful, uh, Wonderful armor, isn't it, to be that self-deprecating? So, in a way, anyone who's got anything mean to say about you, yeah, is immediately neutralized. And he tell he always used to tell this funny story that he was with his children, and his his children, <laughs> one of his children said to you, said to him, uh, "If you had a fight with James Bond, who would win?" He went, "Well, I am James Bond," and they went, "No, no, no, the proper one, Sean Connery." <laughs> So for him to just be that sort of uh, open about it. And I remember I really, when he was still alive, I was always thinking, I'd love to write a movie to bring Sean and Roger together in one movie where they play two sort of aging spies who have to take Viagra before they, <laughs> yeah, before they seduce um, the uh, Russian double agent. But it was not to be. Uh, it sounds it sounds way too realistic. I don't like it. <laughs> um, but no, I got, I got to meet him, and I've, I I am very lucky. I got to go to the set of some of the other movies um, because I was very friendly with David Arnold, who also did the music for um, for Little Britain, and he he obviously did. I think he did five Bond soundtracks. I believe so. Yeah. Um, and so he took me uh, to the Die Another Day set, and we met Piers, who was also totally charming, totally lovely. And I met him on a few other occasions. And once I was out at a restaurant and I'd, I'd seen him a week before and I was on a date with some girl and he went, oh, hi, David. <laughs> this girl was just so impressed I knew James Bond. And Daniel Craig, I saw on stage in 1989 when I was oh, 17 wow. and he was probably about 21 or something. And he was in the National Youth Theatre that I was also in. And he was in uh, a play called Marat Saad where he was topless in a bath as uh, Marat. Um, and I remember at the curtain call, all the girls screaming because he was so sexy. <laughs> and nothing has changed in uh, whatever, 30, 30, 30 odd years. Um, people still scream when they see him. And uh, I've known him a bit socially as well. And he's, he, he's a lot of fun. And I got to go to the set of the new movie can you, can you say anything about that? Well, I didn't. I mean, even if you go to the set, you get to see the set. And very, very kindly, I got a bit of a guided tour. Um, and I got to bring my nephews and my son. And obviously, we sat in the cars and we handled all the weapons and got to see sets and things. But you don't get to see the script and I don't know anything about the plot. Um, but 
we saw a scene being shot with Anna de Armas and Daniel Craig. So, you know, it looked, we got to look through, you know, through, through the, uh, uh, at the uh, at the screen and what the camera was seeing and it, it looked fantastic but you know you could never tell and I got to go to the Skyfall and Spectre sets as well um, and Sam Mendes showed me little bits of the film so I was like this, I mean it was like total total dream come true you know I was with my nephews who are 13 and 8 my son who's 7 but I was the one who was most excited because it's a childhood dream isn't it going to the James Bond set did your de did your son at least for this one time think okay maybe my dad is the shit? Yeah. Well, I asked them all. I said I said to my nephews because I know what it's like sometimes when kids meet well known people they can go very quiet. So I said let's all think of what question you're going to ask Daniel Craig. Mm -hmm. And so my nephews came up with a, where'd you get your clothes from? Are you actually good at poker? <laughs> my son had a really interesting question. It was like. Why did you even want to be James Bond? <laughs> Which is oh. a really kind of interesting question. And then he went, oh, I actually didn't want to. And then he pointed at Barbara Broccoli and went, she made me do it. <laughs> so, uh, so he was uh, he was actually in very good form. We, we went just at the very end of the uh, of the shooting. And uh, oh, I was so gutted when the uh, premiere was cancelled. I obviously you know for good reason. And we're not going to see the movie for a long time. I haven't seen any of it uh, other than the trailer. So... Uh, but we'll see it one day, and it looks like it's going to be a corker. You, you know what I love that I'm hearing, I've got to tell you, David, is I hear a fan talking. You know, that the fact that you're you're in the business, but you can still go to a set and get excited. You can get disappointed when there's a delay in the movie. I, I love that. We can't take the fan out of you. Oh, yeah. I mean, I do think if you watch a Bond movie at least once a week, you're you're going to be in a happier mood. And so I feel like for all those bad times in my life, James Bond's always been there. And there's always that two hours of escapism where you can, you know, you're going to be entertained. There's no question about that. Yeah. And, um, you know, you're going to fall in love with the Bond girl. You're going to go on these amazing adventures with James Bond. You're going to see these amazing locations and you're going to laugh as well because humor is a big part of the series. And so you're always going to have a good time. And I think they've always been so dependable. And actually there's no other film series like it. I mean, you know, there's brilliant film series like Indiana Jones, but, you know, they managed to make four movies. And this is, you know, 25. It's extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. maybe a few more if you count the non-canon ones even. But uh, although we won't bring that up to you because you told me about your feelings on that. Well, uh, it's interesting, isn't it, when you revisit a film having not seen one for a while. So we did discuss Never Say Never Again, and it's a, it's, it's a, hard, it's a hard film to love. Um, yeah. You know, it's and it doesn't feel like a bot even from the moment it starts, something feels really wrong. And you no, just it's missing all the tropes that you find therapeutic, you know. It's interesting. And and I remember Barbara Broccoli in the in the documentary, um, you know, everything or nothing, she said, uh, you know, just having the star alone does not mean you can make a bomb movie. And I thought that's oh. nothing, but it's actually true. That's a good point. By the way, one thing that you and I have talked about before, which I love, is that you consume online content that's Bond related. In fact, we were talking about that young gentleman, Calvin Dyson, who you loved his top 10 and things yeah. like that. Well, well I love screaming at the screen as he revealed his top 10, because that's the thing, isn't it? You can't get Bond fans to agree and you'll meet someone whose favorite Bond movie is your least favorite. And then you'll, you know, and uh, vice versa, and it, it can be frustrating. But I guess that's the great thing. We don't all agree on what's the best one, what's the worst one, who's the best Bond. And so it's an endless topic of conversation, isn't it? It is. It's like dynamic tension. You know, you <laughs> want it there, but it's it's thrilling at the same time. But how, how do you, very busy like everybody else, how do you choose which content to consume? I look at your content and then I see what <laughs> else comes up after that because I've been admiring all the things that you've been doing for quite a long time. Oh, and um, I just like the detail that you go into and obviously the love and appreciation you have for it. And also the, you know, you use your critical faculties as well, because someone who's sort of blindly a fan of every single thing to do with James Bond, it would become boring. And so it's interesting to point out, you know, little bits you wish would be different, but, uh, um, so I've loved that. And then also, you know, sometimes on, on YouTube, it suggests you watch these other videos as well. So I start with you and then I work my way 
down <laughs> to the others. Well, thank you for that. By the way, you, I, we, you, you and I have talked about this before. You've had some very interesting brushes with Bond. One of my favorites, by the way, was when you serenaded, and I don't know if a lot of people have seen this, you serenaded Dame Shirley Bassey by singing her Moonraker. Do you remember doing that? Yes, I did. It was on the Graham Norton show. And she, interestingly, she told me that um, the first choice to sing the song was Johnny Mathis. Did you know about that? Jo it no. was meant, Johnny Mathis was meant to sing Moonraker, but he got ill and couldn't do it the last minute. And then John Barry saw Shirley Bassey in a restaurant and goes, can you help me out? Can you sing this song for me? Because she's always said, it's not really my song. Mm. Um, I get that because the others are more bombastic and they're more obviously her. Um, but yeah, Johnny Mathis version would have been interesting. I also heard at one stage that maybe Frank Sinatra had been asked, but I don't know about that. That could have worked rather well as well. My gosh. Um, but yeah, she, she is an absolute scream. She's about the most fun person you can spend time with. Also really sexy as well. Oh, <laughs> she, absolutely. She's incredibly sexy and fun and naughty. And, uh, again, she's very comfortable with her past. So she's very happy to, uh, to, uh, you know, talk about Goldfinger and everything. And uh, also I know Leslie Brickus very well, the lyricist of, mm -hmm. so he did, um, did he, so he did Goldfinger, You Only Live Twice. Did he do another one as well? I think it's those two. I wish I had some subject matter experts. I don't know. Yeah, he's he's a wonderful, um, wonderful man. He obviously wrote with Anthony Newley, but he is a lyricist on on those Bond songs. We've probably missed one out, but I think I think it's just those two, isn't it? Because Don Black did Thunderball. That's right, isn't it? I'm afraid to say because. <laughs> When we're when we're showing this, there's a chat room of probably 900 people that are screaming out the name, and That's I don't want to get it wrong, but we've forgotten. I'm sorry, we've forgotten. We've forgotten. Please ask for our forgiveness, everybody. Please. <laughs> I, I do have a question about something. So, you you find yourself in a lot of bond experiences. You know, again, part of your what you do for a living. But for example, the Spectre, as the host of the Spectre premiere at the Royal Albert Hall, mm -hmm. you looked so at ease. You know, it, it almost looked like you didn't have to study because you're such a Bond fan. But do those situations still get you excited? Do you get riled up? Well, the reason I put myself up for that, because I just thought, well, I just really want to meet all the people in the film. And although I'll, I will get to go to the premiere, it's like at the Albert Hall with thousands of people and I'll get to go to the party. But again, it's thousands of people. It's not an easy way to meet people. I thought if I'm actually, you know, actually interviewing people on the red carpet, I will get to meet absolutely everybody. And um, I was at ease, but I think I let slip a bit of the plot um, about Blofeld appearing. And I think I got quite a lot of criticism, but actually I just hadn't been briefed and I didn't know that, I thought everyone knew that Blofeld was in the movie. I mean, I can't say it was a surprise to anybody, was it? Nobody. <laughs> no. <laughs> you, you have a movie called Spectre. As soon as they announced it was Spectre, everyone been, that's yeah, it. Yeah, Christoph Waltz is in it, and they haven't really said who he's playing. So you go, well, yeah. he, well so he's Blofeld, get it, right, he's Blofeld. Um, but anyway, I remember some getting some um, some comments from some Bond fans, and I'm sorry if I spoiled it for anyone. But uh, yeah, I, I, it was it was an amazing thing to be part of that evening, and um, you know, I just felt so privileged to be there because as a kid, I used to watch the Bond premieres on television. They don't want to have a, a special program, you know, about mm -hmm. half an hour or so, showing you everything. And I remember thinking, that is the most glamorous thing in the world. And to be at a Bond film premiere would be the absolute ultimate. You know, I wasn't really thinking I would be well known or anything. I was just thinking, wow, if I could go to a Bond film premiere, my life would be complete. <laughs> so, um, I, yes, I, I got to go. I was working actually for uh, uh, Casino Royale and, um, and, uh, and Quantum of Solace and didn't get to go to either of those premieres, but I got to go to, to Skyfall Inspector. And I don't know if you can say, so if you can't, absolutely fine, but were you going to do something similar for No Time to Die if we they had a premiere? They hadn't asked me, so I can only assume that they, they, I don't know, they hadn't asked me, either they knew they were casting the premiere or they just didn't want me to do it, I don't know. But whatever, I got the invite to go, so uh, so I was pleased about that. You know what I think happened? They were about to dial and then COVID-19, that's it. Yeah, yeah. 
it's um it's a it's a very strange situation isn't it waiting and having seen all the press and uh, heard the song and you know even seen her uh, perform it and um you know all the merchandise coming out everything and then it's like ah oh. i mean i mean daniel had even um done saturday night live which was yes. a very unusual thing for him to do because uh, as far as i know he's never done it before and uh you know he's a little um, shy about some things and so uh he did, did all that and so the movie's not out for six months so I just pray that we do get to see it in November, um, and obviously the most important thing is that the world's in a much better place. But um, but we'll need some escapism, and we'll need some fun after all this. We will, we will. And thanks, thanks to you for kind of distracting us for a bit. I, I do have one more question. It's it's a doozy though, so you may have to use your creative muscles for this one. Uh, you've we mentioned you've done a lot of uh, Bond experiences. In fact, one of the interviews it was very interesting. You said I couldn't be in a Bond film because I've worn a dress as part of my vocation, although two bad guys have worn dresses in Bond films. But if you were to be in a Bond film, what character would you want to play? Ah, well, I'd like them to bring back Mr. Wint and Mr. Kidd. Yes. <laughs> and um, I would like to be uh, one of those two. I think there's two of the best uh, henchmen of all time. And I think that, that actually that the thread of, that they create through the movie is fantastic. And it's very clever because you only when at the very end of the movie you sort of remember that Bond actually hasn't met them at any point. So when they bring in the uh, the Bond Supremes yes, right. uh, at the end, you realise it's only because he rep uh, recognises the perfume that one of them wears that he, he knows that they're bad guys who are, who are in on it, which is fantastic. So Maybe yes, so some sort of henchman. Or there is an amazing um, character in Tomorrow Never Dies of the assassin. Is he called Dr. Kaufman or something? Dr. Kaufman. And I could yeah. shoot you from Stuttgart and still... Yeah. yeah that guy. What an amazing scene. Yes. How brilliantly written, brilliantly played, and how unlike just about anything you'd ever seen in a Bond movie. So I really like it when they take those leaps of imagination. We also discussed the uh, scene in Skyfall where Bond is running through the streets of London and Judy Dench is reciting the Tennyson poem um, at the uh, at the hearing. And it's just an amazing scene because also it's, it's sort of cross-cutting. There's something you don't see a lot in Bond movies. Also using a poem like that, uh, being spoken by this kind of great Shakespearean actress, it, mm -hmm. it just worked so well. And it was just such, I think it's one of the most euphoric moments in any Bond movie. I'd say probably my, one of my other absolute favorite euphoric moments where just the filmmaking sort of takes off is um, in You Only Live Twice, the fight on the rooftop. Oh, where yes. Do this incredibly perverse thing in a way, which is take the camera far away from the fight, which, you know, you actually conventional wisdom would tell you, well, that's not a very good idea. You want to be in the action. But somehow it's just brilliant, isn't it? And you just get a sense of James Bond versus the world. I actually love that scene because nowadays so many films are guilty in an action way of showing just elbows and fists and you don't know what's happening. No. You can't follow the action. So this yeah. is almost like having a balcony view of it. It was amazing. Yeah. But it's an, a very, very inventive piece of filmmaking to do that, especially yeah. that period. So I, I love those kind of moments, um, you know, because there's been some amazing filmmakers uh, who've, who've got their hands and uh, got their hands onto Bond. I got to meet Lewis Gilbert too. Lewis Gilbert and Roger Moore were having lunch in a restaurant called the Wolseley, and I'd not met Lewis, but obviously knew Roger, so I went up and chatted to them. And Lewis Gilbert, even though I was about forty-four at the time or something, Lewis Gilbert went, "How did you like my friend Jaws?" <laughs> It's like I was eight. It was the most wonderful thing. I went, well, I loved him. I loved him. But I want to know because um, I want to know what your favorite Bond movie is today. Let's My least favorites because it's mean. Because they probably made those movies. They tried their hardest. They didn't turn out great. It's not, it's and not I do like that about you too. It's positivity. I mean, we, we need some positivity. I, I would say the one, if somebody came to me and said, look, David, I have bad news for you. You can only see one Bond film for the rest of your life. We apologize, but that's just the fact. I would have to go with Casino Royale. Yeah. Sorry. And it's it's got everything. And even if it wasn't a Bond film, it has great action. 
uh, character evolution and arcs. It's got a romance story, amazing David Arnold soundtrack. It's got a little bit of everything. Thunderball comes a close second for me, though. Yeah, I love Thunderball. I think Martin Campbell was just, I just don't know why they didn't get him to do more because, I mean, he's just an incredible job with, with GoldenEye and Casino Royale. Now, Casino Royale is really special because I think the story properly draws you in. And I also think because Bond is sort of untested at the start of the film, therefore he goes on a journey. And that's not normally the case, or not always the case at least, because he doesn't really have a journey to go on. He's the greatest spy of all time. It's always quite funny actually when I always think at the start of the movies, M doesn't trust Bond's instincts for something because he wants to go and do something and M is disapproving. Hang on, this guy saved the world without fail about 20 times. What is he don't trust about him? But um, I guess you need that for, for the journey. Now, Casino Royale is very special. I think Skyfall is very special as well, mm -hmm. partly because, I mean, it's so beautifully directed and shot and acted, and it's, it's just one of the most beautiful Bond movies. But I pretty much like everything, and I mm -hmm. certainly love everything um, that I saw as a kid growing up, you know, because I... I, I no, they were just such important movies to keep me happy through 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 my childhood and teens. So I kind of I love them all, and they, I sometimes fall out of love with one for a while, hmm. and then I see it again and I think, what? Why was I giving this film a hard time? It's actually <laughs> it's actually really fun, um, and sometimes that 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 happens. But uh, the one I've probably seen the most amount of times is on a Majesty's Secret Service. And I think the reason is because I think the ending is just so shocking and surprising that somehow you want to revisit it. Mm -hmm. The theory about films with unusual endings, you want to watch them again because I know it sounds crazy, but you want to see if it ends in a different way when you watch it again. I don't know oh, absolutely. Thing, but it's just something about you go, oh, this story, there's something unsettling in the story. Um, and so... And that one, it's just such a kind of incredible one-off. Yeah. Um, There's 90% of your brain that knows how it's going to end, but the 10% is sometimes so overwhelming. I, I'm the same way with Quantum of Solace. I think Quantum of Solace, it, it's... There's some very badass Bond moments, as they say, but there's some really impactful moments where you see Bond not as a secret agent, but an assassin. And, you know, every time I see that, I, I, I it just it has this impact for me. Probably like the ending of Honor Majesty's Secret Service. Yeah, I like I like I was watching Quantum of Solace the other day and I was I was really enjoying it. I think I think it um they had some difficulties because there was a writer's strike at the time when they were making the movie, which meant perhaps certain elements of the plot didn't entirely gel. Mm. But it's beautiful looking film with some incredible action sequences. And he looks amazing and he's in his Tom Ford suits for the first time. So I think yeah. if you're an absolute closed nerd, quantum occupies a very special place because there's clothes in that. I mean, that, that coat he has at the end uh, yes. he visits, visits like Vesper's ex-boyfriend is like unbelievable, isn't it? And I love that you see London in the rain in that movie because normally you see a really nice shot, quite a sunny day. You see across the Thames, you see the Houses of Parliament, you see a red bus go by. Go, oh, wow, there we are, London, isn't it wonderful? Whereas... Um, in that film, you just see the rain and you see the snow at the end, and that, yeah, and so it has a has a really I don't know, has quite a, you no, know I'm saying a sort of vis a, vi a visceral sort of sense to that movie, and that car chase at the start is absolutely insanely good. I mean, that is an amazing opening sequence, isn't it? It is, and to, for me, the the car chase was a grower, not a shower, in the sense that. Uh, I, I liked it second and third watching because of its frantic nature. Mm -hmm. But the rain in London, is th that's an aspect that I've talked about with people because they actually show the word London in the puddle and then the car runs over it, which is perfect. Yeah, yeah, I think he's, he's a great filmmaker and he, he really did something special. I, I, I mean, I know some people have a problem with it, but I think just forgive it that because they were trying to make a movie in the middle of a writer's strike, which is vir a virtually impossible thing to do. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'm just, I'm so glad, you know, my, my father passed on his love, uh, of Bond to me and I'm getting to pass it on to my son and my nephews and, um, it's a very special thing and I'm so glad to have, uh, you know, that the movies are in all our lives and it's lovely to connect with fellow fans and I, I, I love meeting 
fans and there's so much always to talk about with Bond isn't there you know, and most Bond fans are really are really serious about it so they they, they have a, a proper in-depth knowledge of it um, but yeah it's uh, it's a big part of my life and actually talking to you now I want to go away and watch a Bond movie which <laughs> movie do you think I should watch because I've just got those new the, the new 4Ks Ooh. of of Daniel's movies but I don't know, I can watch any Bond movie, really. I haven't seen a Pierce Brosnan one for a while, so I could watch a Pierce Brosnan one. Yeah, I absolutely love, and I know it's controversial, I love Tomorrow Never Dies. Uh, it's just, again, David Arnold's soundtrack. Yeah. Uh, Pierce just seems to be more comfortable in this one, a little bit more relaxed, you know, swarmy. I just, he's fantastic in it. Yeah. What, what do you think? Lots to enjoy. I could watch that. I do like The World Is Not Enough a lot as well. Oh, yeah. I yeah. love the boat chase um, at the beginning, um, especially I love Sophie Marceau. Mm. Um, I think there's a lot, and of course it's, it's Desmond Llewellyn's last one, isn't it? Yeah. So, so it's, 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 it's lovely seeing him. He was like the lucky charm. I actually love it when he gets more to do, like in uh, License to Kill. He is actually yes. like a, a co-starring role, isn't it? And, yeah. uh, and they started to use him a lot more, didn't they? Like in Octopussy, where he comes on the balloon at the end and stuff. Um, anyway, it's been amazing talking to you. We could talk all night, but we we've got bomb movies to watch, so we'll have to save it for another day. Absolutely. David, thank you so much for joining us, distracting us. And as soon as we're able to, I'd, I'd love to come and, and maybe have a martini with you as well. That would be lovely. So let's see what we can do next and let me know if, if your work or your life brings you to London and we'll, we'll, we'll hire out a cinema and we'll do, let's do a Bond double bill. And I love I've, it. I've recently met Britt Eklund and I really want to invite her um, to come along and uh, watch Mum the Golden Gun with us because it will be absolutely wonderful. So Done. Uh, That's what, another one of my guilty pleasures, that film. Oh, it's great. Christopher yeah. Lee. Yeah. Go wrong with that. Who so, doesn't like a third nipple? My gosh. <laughs> so much to enjoy in that one. Yeah. Well, look, it's lovely talking to you, David. Talk to you. And let's talk again soon. And a big hello to all Bond fans. And let's, let's all cross our fingers and uh, hold our hands together in prayer for November. Absolutely. Something special on our hands. David, thank you so much. Take care, David. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks for watching this episode. If you want to be up on the latest from the Bond experience, just click on this subscribe and subscribe to our channel. You're going to get all the latest and greatest information plus some exclusive content. And by the way, speaking of content, here's something especially for you just because we know you. Talk to you soon.